Well, good morning. I'm really excited about this series because here's what I know. If you can keep your soul healthy, the other stuff will come along and nothing in life can disturb you when you have peace in your soul. And so I hope as we do this that some of you may become aware of some things that you never really thought about. <clears throat> now, you definitely know what this is. What is this called? Happy Meal. You knew right off the bat. You saw the little smile. They convince you that French fries are smiling at you. How many of you as an adult have ever eaten a Happy Meal as an adult? Okay, I see those hands. Okay, these are my people, right? And especially if you had like three bucks in your pocket and that's all you had, you were like, well, I need a drink too, so I got to get a Happy Meal. Here's the thing about a Happy Meal. It is not good for you. I don't care if you add apples to it or not. It is not good for you. Is anybody shocked by that? Anybody in here like, you know, that's a good thing? You know, uh, uh, by the way, thanks for the stepping in something illustration. That's all I can think of this morning. Now, here's what's, here's what's funny about uh, uh, fast food. When I was 16, my dad, uh, w w every once in a while we'd get Burger King. And by every once in a while, I meant like about once a week. And uh, uh, for the family for dinner, that was dinner. And we had a Burger King. We had one of the first Burger Kings. I believe it's the first one that actually we used to go to. And uh, when I turned 16, my dad decided that I was going to go get it. And so as a typical 16-year-old, I said, so can I get whatever I want if I go? To which my dad, who did not want to drive to Burger King, quickly said, oh, yes. So I would go and order for the family. And then let me tell you what I got if I was trying to be healthy. This, this was before they put the calories on the board. This is before, you know, so I thought, what's healthy? Hamburger or Whopper? or chicken. And I thought, well, chicken's healthier, obviously. Now, this was before grilled chicken. They didn't know what grilled chicken was. They fried everything. And somehow in my teenager mind, I thought, it's chicken. It's healthy. Then I thought, you know, I know that french fries are pretty bad for you. So instead of french fries, I would get Onion rings, right, that's exactly right. And I was trying to be a little healthier. I never even thought of a diet drink because, you know, Coke is just fine. And maybe throw an apple pie in there. You know, you just never knew. Remember the apple pie that would burn your face off? I don't know. I think McDonald's had those, not Burger King, but uh, it was misery. And so what I'm saying is this. Listen, a lot of people know so much more about physical health and even today, emotional health. But we are clueless about our spiritual health, about what's really going on. We're like me as a teenager eating a fried chicken sandwich, onion rings, and a Coke and thinking, I'm doing good. There are people who are struggling with all kinds of issues and they assume that they're physical issues or they assume that they're mental issues and they don't realize that what may really be going on is a spiritual situation, a even warfare that's going on in our hearts that's trying to keep us from what really matters. And so today what I want to talk about is just kind of prepare us for this idea of soul keeping by asking this question, why... Do a series on the soul. Why? Well, I kind of explained it um, because we know the importance of other things. But we want to, for the next few weeks, focus on spiritual health. What are we feeding our souls? Are we feeding our souls junk food and wondering why spiritually we're so discouraged? By the way, you can be discouraged by what's going on in your soul. Your soul can affect your physical body. Your soul can affect your mental state. That's why Jesus, as busy as he was, was never rushed. He was able to find rest no matter where he was. So here's the first point. The soul, and I love this, what does this symbol mean? The soul is greater than the mental and the physical. I'm sorry to bring up high school math back to some of you for the first time in 30 years. The soul is more important greater than mental and physical health. Now, let me tell you one more story before I get into the verses today. Uh, when I was in high school, actually, I started running track when I was in sixth grade. 
And I ran track for the same coach, Coach Warner, from the time I was in sixth grade and the time I was in 12th grade. By the way, side note, one day I was talking to one of my friends here, uh, uh, Rudy Moberg, and I mentioned my track coach, and he said, that's really weird. My roommate from college uh, was Warner and found out that it was actually his roommate from college, and they had begun in touch, and I actually got them in touch with each other just recently, which is really kind of cool. Um, they went to college together. So anyway, so every year, track started the same way. All the students from 6th grade to, to 12th grade would go out for track. There would sometimes be over 100 students. And on the first day, every year, we had to run. He would say, okay, five miles. And we would run down uh, in Miami, in the heat, down to uh, uh, the, what's called the Wackenhut Estate now. I don't remember what it was called back then. Over a bridge, which, you know, was the highest point of Miami. And uh, over this little bridge, and we, we'd run around and come back down uh, Coral Way and back to the school. And so the first day we would run, and I'll never forget waking up that second day. Because I, every year, every year, I thought, I'm in pretty good shape. Until I woke up the next morning. And then I realized, I'm not in good shape. And then the second day, the coach would say, okay, go again. Now, by the second day, usually about half of whoever showed up the first day was gone. He did that the whole week. And I believe part of the reason he did it was just to weed out people that really didn't want to participate in track. And boy, did he weed them out. Because suddenly you realize when you're running a race, you're not healthy. Some of us don't realize we're not physically or spiritually healthy until we have a struggle or a trial. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, Matthew 16, 24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, time out, time out. I want to show you something about this word. This is the word psyche, and it literally means soul. But you'll notice, and it's in this Verse, these verses four times. What's funny is twice they translate it life, and probably in your Bible they translate it life twice and soul twice. And th it means both, but it really means soul. So you could actually read this verse, for whoever wants to save their soul will lose it, but whoever loses their soul for me will find it. And then he says this, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world? yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He'll reward each person according to what they have done. Now, when you look at this verse in context, right before this, Jesus calls Peter Satan, which is awesome. Like, of all the insults you could give, I would think that would be like, like, what's the worst thing you could call somebody? Well, if you're Jesus, you look at Peter and you go, get behind me, Satan. That's, that's pretty significant. I'm thinking Peter's feelings were probably a touch hurt at that point. So right after that, Jesus said, listen, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross. And you have to realize, <laughs> Jesus had not gone to the cross yet. The disciples, as usual, were still clueless. It would be like if I said to you today, anybody who wants to follow Jesus needs to take up their electric chair. You would go, what? You'll notice that Jesus equates saving your soul to sacrificing for him. See, we want God to just give us all the good stuff. I want peace and I want joy. And boy, we love all the fruits of the Spirit. Love and joy, peace, patience. Boy, that'd be a good one, wouldn't it? When I'm driving. Right? Kindness. Goodness. Gentleness. We love all that stuff. But we don't want to have to do what Jesus says first, which is take up our cross. Sometimes following Jesus means denying yourself, doing difficult things, denying what you want to do to do what he wants you to do. Because you cannot make a difference in the world if all you're ever concerned about is you. It's when we deny ourselves and say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you even when it's hard. Even when I don't like what's next. Even when I don't like dealing with what's, what I'm dealing with now. God, I'm going to follow you. And the Bible says, and Jesus says, when you deny yourself, take up your cross, what happens? You gain your soul. Too often we're trading our soul for the things we want. For our desires. For our things that matter to us. 
I love what John Ortberg says in his book. When my soul is not centered in God, I define myself by my accomplishments. You know, for pastors, how many people are in church? That's how we define ourselves, right? Pastors do that all the time. I, I can't tell you the number of times I go to a meeting with a bunch of pastors. They have two questions for me. How many people are coming to your church? How much money do you have? Over and over. I've been going to meetings for 25 years. Those two questions over and over. And I've chosen to lie about both of them to see what expression I get. So sometimes I'll say 2,000 and millions. And the people are like, because they think it's a competition. It's gotten to be funny. So he says, your accomplishments, your physical appearance, or my title, or my important friends. When I lose these, I lose my identity. Listen, if our identity is based in the things we do, if our identity is in the way people treat us, if our identity is in the number of people that come to church or how much money comes in, if your identity is in your job and how good you are at it, or if your boss likes you, if your identity is in your marriage and even in your family, which is a wonderful thing, but if that's your identity, you can lose it. But if your identity is in Christ, no matter what happens around you, no matter what you lose on this earth, you will never lose it. Number two, we need to recognize that sin impacts our soul. Now, I was trying to think of what is sin like in our lives. And I, I, it's kind of like poison, but I, I thought poison might not be a good illustration. So my sister-in-law helped me with this illustration the other night. She had gone uh, and bought some, uh, she's staying at her house and she bought some coconut ice cream pops. Now, I like coconut. She said, do you like coconut? Which instantly I went, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. And so she said, you want one? I said, yes. And she brought me an ice cream, coconut ice cream. Man, it was good. Ate that coconut ice cream. And about 20 minutes later, all of a sudden, my arms started itching. And all of a sudden, my lips started feeling a little funky. I, I could, my face started to go just a little numb. And I said to her, is there egg in these pops? She said, why would they put egg in coconut pops? Now, she knows I'm allergic to egg, so either she's trying to kill me or she really didn't know. I'm not sure. You get to decide which. So I go and I open the freezer and I look at the box. Number one ingredient, thankfully, coconut. Number two ingredient, eggs. Absolutely. I'm itching just thinking about it. Now, I don't know if you've ever had an allergic reaction. I've had some funny ones. Kristen and I were out in Iowa for Randy and Jill's wedding. It was a wonderful time, except for one day. When Kristen went and got us a sandwich, she said, what do you want? And I said, honey, whatever you want on it, you know I like everything. And so we ate this sandwich. It was delicious from a deli there. It was so good. And we were enjoying the nice weather. I mean, it was like July in Iowa, and it was like 70 degrees. We didn't know what to do. We were like, wow, it's nice. So we sat outside. We ate our sandwiches. And about a half hour later, I said, honey, um, I got to ask you a question. Was there avocado on that sandwich? And she went, oh, no. So we instantly got on GPS, found the closest uh, uh, Walgreens or whatever CVS we could find. We walked there. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Hitch, but I reenacted it. Went into the Walgreens, grabbed a bottle of of uh, uh, Benadryl and drank it on the way to the counter and then fell us dead asleep about a half hour later. What happened? I had something that, that reacted with me. I'm allergic to a couple of things. A couple. What we don't realize sometimes is when we allow sin in our lives and pride, selfishness and self-centeredness and lust, all of those things affect our souls. Listen to what Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. By the way, Corinth was made Las Vegas look tame. Corinth made Las Vegas look like church. If you go to Corinth today, you can still see on the tiles where they would point you to where the prostitution was. Where they would point you where things that you wanted to do wrong, that was where they were. I mean, you go there today and the signs are still there. So you can imagine what it was like thousands of years ago. And Paul says this to the early church. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. Basically, hey, as a Christian, you can do whatever you want, but it may not be good for you. And then he continues. I have the right to do anything, but I won't be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach, BK, fried chicken. 
By the way, that thing used to be the size of a sub roll. I don't know if you knew that. Now they're like this. But, but Oh, so bad for you, right? All right. But God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for his body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. And then a few verses later, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies, listen to this, most of you have heard this verse, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You aren't your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. E. Honor God with your body. So here's the deal. Paul is warning the early church, yes, you can do all these things, but you're allergic to them. And when you do them, they're going to have consequences. We live in a, a sexed culture where everything, every TV show, every commercial, everything on the internet, I mean, you're looking at the news and they're launching stuff at you 24-7. And Paul says, beware of that. Because although you may be able to do it, it's not good for you. And what begins to happen when we pursue other things is it pulls our spirit away from God and we begin to desire things that are far from God. Is there anything in your life that may not be bad, but you're pursuing that rather than pursuing what God wants you to do? But the key is not to try to uh, overcome sin. The key is to do what Jesus says in John 15. Remain in me as all, I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. See, the most important thing. Is that we recenter our lives on Christ. I love what John Ortberg says here. He says, the goal is not to try to be sinless. In all your efforts to keep from sinning, what do you focus on? You know, it's like Weight Watchers. They say, don't focus on the food. Which is easy for them to say. Because they already lost the weight. And I love McDonald's french fries. Right? By the way, this box still smells like McDonald's french fries. Days later. It's like Satan in this. Anyway, okay. God wants you to focus on Him, to be with Him, abide in me. Just relax and learn to enjoy His presence. You know, over and over as we've, I've been reading this book and finished the book and, and been working through this series. Next week we're going to be going uh, to the book of Romans for a few weeks. Here's the thing. There's a verse in the Old Testament in Psalms that says, Why so downcast, O my soul? And I think it's a good idea for sometimes for us to look at our lives and say, what am I really focusing on? Am I allowing God to flow through me and into me as I focus on what he wants me to? Or am I looking at everything else and pursuing that and wondering why I'm so weak spiritually, why I struggle so much? But when we abide in him, guess what comes natural? Love, and joy, and peace. So when you find out you're not patient... The problem is not your patience. The problem is your abiding. God, I want to abide in you. Number three, here's something you need to know. Our souls crave rest. You know what the opposite of rest is? You think it's tired. It's restless. We all know people who are restless. They move church to church. They've been to 12 churches since we've known them. They move from marriage to marriage. We're like, what number is this? They move from house to house. I've got a friend who I think in the last 10 years has sold his house four times. Now, I don't know if he's just trying to make money moving houses or if he's restless. It's not my job to decide. But I can tell you this. A lot of people, the reason they pursue all different things has nothing to do with what they want to do. It has to do with their spirit, which isn't resting. And so they can pursue pleasure for a little while and that'll give them some relief. They can pursue drugs for a little while. that will give them relief. If they're a Christian, they can pursue a new church or a new study or a new whatever for a little while. And even though they think it's about that thing that's renewing them, what they're doing, they're just hiding from the restlessness in their soul where they find no rest. We all know that not having rest is about the worst thing, right? 
You're exhausted. You lay down. You go to sleep. An hour later, your eyes pop wide open. And you're like, I want to sleep. And your, body, and your brain's like, no, no, we're going to have this discussion about something that happened in 1983. It's two o'clock in the morning. No, no, I think this is a good time. We're restless. We're restless. This is what it says in God's word here in Matthew 11. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Time out. What Jesus is about to tell them, <laughs> he says ahead of time, you don't have to be smart to get this. So I feel much better about this next paragraph. Here we go. For this you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to be by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And to those the Son chooses to reveal Him. And then He says this. Come to me. All you who are weary. Anybody in here feel tired at all this week? Anybody in here tell somebody they were tired? Come on, raise your hand. Come on. Let's see. Are you too tired to raise your hand? Okay, I get it. All right. Pastor, I wasn't even listening. I fell asleep during that part, right? We've all said we're tired to people, right? So he says, come to me if you're tired. So guess what? Let's go. And what will happen? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. Time out. Let me tell you what he's referring to. See, <clears throat> in the time of Jesus, when you went under a Pharisee or a Sadducee or a rabbi... They would give you something called, they called it the yoke of the Torah. Now, don't mix it up. It's not called yoke of the rabbi. A lot of Christians mess that up. Not that you really care. But it was the idea of the yoke of the Torah. And what that meant, it meant the first five books of the Old Testament, all the laws in there, but also the oral law. By the way, the guy Paul was trained under was the last rabbi of the oral law. Isn't that Interesting how that works. And so the oral law, on top of all the laws, basically, you had to watch what you did all the time. And it was exhausting. No cheeseburgers. No shrimp. No bacon. No walking too far on Sunday. Avoiding certain people, not sitting certain places, watching out for certain things you did, making certain garments to wear them just right, putting Bible verses on your forehead, on your doorway, all kind of rules and laws. And Jesus says to them, listen, take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn from me. Why? For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And then he says this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because it's not about a list of rules. It's about a relationship with Jesus. And when you try to be righteous on your own, <laughs> you fall. But when Jesus is pulling the yoke, sometimes you fall. And guess what? If you're in a yoke, he keeps going. <laughs> the good news about a yoke is no matter what happens to you, he just keeps going. So on your worst day, when your sin is more than what you do right, His righteousness prevails. And you surrender to Him again, knowing that His burden is light, because He is carrying you, and He is carrying me. And it's not by my righteousness or following all the rules that I get to stand before God. It's when I get to heaven and I say to God, I'm here, and He says, why should I let you into heaven? And Jesus steps in the way and goes, He's with me. And I get to go, I think, you know, with me, I feel like God's going to like interrupt Jesus and go, are you sure? I mean, did you see what he did that one Sunday? Okay. By the way, for those watching online, somebody said one. Yeah, that's smart. Your soul is greater than your mental or physical state. Beware of poisoning your soul with sin. And allowing it to keep you from, from living in God's presence. But know this, you need rest. And that rest is not going to be found in the most comfortable bed you buy. It's going to be found when you take some time to say, God, I'm going to rest in you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first step to getting rest is to receive him. Basically, we know that we can't earn our way to heaven, so Jesus came and died for us, paid the penalty for our sin, so that when we surrender to Him, or as He said earlier, when we take up our cross and follow Him, He takes our sin 
and gives us his righteousness. If you want to do that today and surrender to him, you can do that knowing that he died and rose again today. And he lives so that we can take his yoke and not have to carry this life by ourselves. If you're a Christian and you're tired, maybe you're physically tired, maybe you're emotionally tired, I want to encourage you. I may not be able to fix the emotional. I may not be able to fix the physical. But I know who can fix the spiritual. So find rest in him. So that even when you're exhausted, your soul is not exhausted. Even when you're worn out, your soul is pursuing him. Rest in him today. I hope for the next six weeks that we can all find rest in him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these moments together. Lord, I thank you that in you our souls find rest. In you we find power. Lord, in you we find strength to pursue the things you want us to pursue. Lord, I pray that in these next six weeks we would become very aware of the spiritual battle going on around us and in us and that we could surrender to you because all we can do sometimes is surrender. Lord, I pray if anyone here or watching online doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Lord, for those of you us fighting you in an area of our life, we want to right now surrender that area to you and receive your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.